Now you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in Iran, in English and Persian, on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi and I'm presenting this week's program with my co-host Faribors Puya. Hi, from me. In this week's program, we're going to be discussing the issue of why a scapegoating of immigrants is xenophobic and racist. We'll have a very interesting interview with the human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell on this very issue. What are the myths around immigration and why immigrants are scapegoated? We'll also have shocking news of the week, which is the terrible news of the attack on a children's school in Peshawar, as well as the insane fatwa of the week, which will be on Baha'is in Iran and how they have been deemed to be haram by um, a fatwa that's been issued recently. Um, anyway, before we go into our program, let's first listen to a short background clip on the main issue. Stay with us. In Britain and Europe, immigrants are being blamed for social ills and there's a rise in far-right and xenophobic parties and groups. Recent demonstrations in Germany against immigrants and a focus on immigration as the main election issue in Sweden are examples of this. In Iran too, there is similar anti-Afghan propaganda with the regime blaming them for everything from crimes to drugs. Much of the propaganda against migrants is based on myths, with migrants being used as scapegoats for government cuts and austerity measures for profit and self-interest. We are hearing a lot about uh, immigrants being the reason behind so much of societal ills right here in Britain, but this is something that's taking place across the world and we've seen it quite extensively in Iran as well against Afghans. And I think it, it's interesting how, particularly in, in times when there's some form of crisis, that those who are the most vulnerable in society, and of course that's migrants and asylum seekers, uh, they're often blamed for ills that very often are the direct result of austerity measures, government cuts, and you find that it, the government often uses migrants as a scapegoat in order to avoid scrutiny of its own policies and measures. I, I think you're right. Look at when the uh, Greece, Greece economy went into uh, recession as a result of the banking crisis. Uh, we'll see the rise of the right-wing fascist party, uh, New Dawn, uh, in an attack on immigrants and foreigners in Athens and other cities in Greece. And you'll see that um, in Britain again with the rise of UKIP. You'll see in Germany now, recent, in recent weeks, we've had demonstrations. The neo-fascists uh, come to the streets and around the issue of immigration and Swedish right wing. You can see that. It's very actually, I uh, think it's very corporately driven. So it's not just, oh, there's unemployment, so people get upset. So it's not from within the society. It is very designed, corporately driven, corporate capitalism actually drives this automatically as soon as they want to reduce the rights of the population, reduce cuts to public services and social services of various kinds. Parallel to that, to divert the attention, they uh, support the right-wing groups, so they divert the attention of the society from the real issues that exist and the policies. Well, I mean, it does make sense because when you look at the, for example, the airtime that a group like UKIP gets, even though they really don't have that many members in Parliament, you know, or even in the European Parliament, it's definitely, you know, it, it's a useful tool. UKIP has sort of made it respectable to be bigoted against migrants, yeah. to be xenophobic. And I think media has a, a great a part to play. Um, Nigel Farage was taken to New York um, for an interview uh, in Fox News immediately after the uh, end of the interview. He's called back in the, uh, uh, he called to the back room to speak to the boss and that's, guess who that was? That was Murdoch. To, they had uh, 45 minutes of chat behind closed doors. Clearly media and, and corporate sort of uh, uh, capital really is behind this drive. They organize them, they're continuously in the news and uh, they support them. The rise of UKIP is media related as well. It's not a hype but it's part of the social engineering and redesigning politics in various uh, uh, countries to push through uh, um, the cuts. austerity Definitely. and the cuts. Absolutely, Definitely. Yes. And let's listen to uh, the um, interview we just did with the wonderful human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell. He talks 
in depth about this and particularly he gives examples of the myths around this issue. It's a wonderful interview. Do stay with us and listen to it and we'll be back to discuss it further. Hello, Peter Tatchell. Thank you for agreeing to do an interview with us. You are, um, you know, a hero for many people uh, in, in Britain and internationally as well. There are so many things I could talk to you about, but I would like to focus on the issue of immigration because there is a huge lot of concern now about this sort of anti-immigrant climate that we're faced with here in Britain as well as Europe. Why do you think that is the case? My first observation is that having studied the experience of the economic crisis in the 1930s and the way in which minorities were scapegoated then, in particular Jewish people, you can see there are echoes of that scapegoating today as we face a contemporary economic crisis. Uh, the target this time is primarily uh, refugees and immigrants. Um, it is very, very disturbing the way in which not only the far right, but even some mainstream conservative parties have embraced this anti-immigrant agenda. But more than that, uh, of course, even some of the social democratic parties have also piled on the anti-immigrant bandwagon. And to me, uh, apart from the simple unethical nature of those attacks on other mostly poor and vulnerable people, um, it's also very disturbing in the sense that it's giving a false narrative. There is an economic crisis. It wasn't caused by asylum seekers or immigrants. It was caused by bankers and other big finance houses uh, which played fast and loose with the economy. They've got away with it. None of them have been sent to prison. None of them have even been prosecuted. Um, yet, poor immigrants who are desperate for a better life and who in many cases are actually contributing to our economy are being blamed. Yeah, well, let me ask you about that. There's a couple of points that come out of what you've said. One is the issue, the issue that a lot of this blaming is based on myths and untruths, really. Can you expand a bit on that? Well, we know in Britain that um, most of the immigrants who are coming to Britain from other parts of Europe, mostly from within the European Union, um, these are very enterprising, energetic, hard-working people. They're doing jobs that most British people are unwilling to do. Uh, if we didn't have them here in our workforce, our economy would be worse off. So far from being a drain, they contribute to the British economy and indeed to the wider European economy. So one of the myths is, you know, they are taking our benefits and, you know, exploiting the welfare state. The reality is that immigrants on the whole contribute more than they take out. They're less likely to uh, apply for benefits. They've come here because they want to work, they want to earn a decent income, and many of them have the skills that we need. And even when they haven't got the skills, they're doing unskilled jobs that employers cannot find British people to do. Um, some people argue that they're coming here to take advantage of what's called health tourism. Um, they're here to take advantage of our National Health Service. Yet the reality is uh, the figures are very small, plus most of these are young immigrants who are fit and healthy, and they're not draining the National Health Service at all. The real drain on the health service is, of course, the million-plus Britons, elderly, mostly elderly Britons, who are living in Spain. They're much more likely to be a drain on the Spanish health service than the European immigrants who come to our country. Um, in addition, of course, our National Health Service depends on foreign nationals to function. A quarter of all the doctors um, in the National Health Service in Britain are from overseas. Now, we couldn't function without them. So to blame them is really, you know, is poking ourselves in the eye. Um, they are vital for the health service 
and the care it provides. And in a way, you, you, you referred to this where you said that the economic crisis was the result of, you know, um, something else and immigrants are being scapegoated. And it's the same with all the cuts in social services, legal aid, you know, schools, libraries are being closed. And again, immigrants seem to be the easiest scapegoat for all of this, don't they? Yeah, it, it plays into a racist subtext. Now, not all the people who make these arguments are necessarily racist or racist by intent, but the actual effect of what they're saying does certainly have racist overtones because most of the migrants they're complaining about are from other nationalities and other ethnicities. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to point the finger, but this is a typical tactic of the right all throughout history right-wing political parties have all throughout history sought to scapegoat and demonize others to distract attention from you know the, the crisis and the problems and the failures of their governments but also to deflect attention away from what is really causing austerity and economic downturn it has been a reckless free market capitalist system where some very rich and powerful people have exploited it for their own advantage, taken risks which have turned out to be disastrous, and everybody else is having to pay. Now, the immigrants and refugees did not cause this crisis. They are not responsible for it. If we got rid of them, it would not have meant there was no crisis. The crisis would still be with us. Uh, and in a sense, you're saying they're helping uh, to alleviate some of the crisis in, in the sense of you know, I just read the statistics that all of the new nurses, out of all the new nurses, I think a majority, was it five out of six or something ridiculous like that, are actually foreign born and how important they are to the health service, as you had mentioned as well. And can um, I just say that um, some years ago, I helped an Iraqi gay man get asylum here in Britain. He'd been under threat of being killed by the Shiite, Shiite Islamist militias in Iraq. He escaped to Britain. Um, he was a doctor and when he won asylum he ended up working in a part of the country where his particular skills were desperately needed. So he ended up making a real positive contribution to the uh, health needs of people in that community. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, one of the issues also which I'd like to go back to is one of the things you mentioned in your last response and it is this whole idea that there are racist undertones when immigrants are targeted. Can you explain that more? Because you do find a lot of mainstream parties also talking about the issue that discussing immigration and um, in a way is not, doesn't have racist undertones. Why, why do you think that it does? Well, I think we know that, um, you know, there are, you know, a, a big sort of, campaign going on or campaigns going on uh, around uh, immigration. Um, some of course is from within the EU, from Poland, Bulgaria and Romania. Um, but a lot of it is of course uh, from other non-European countries and non-white countries. And so it's very interesting the way in which um, people from the far right like the BNP, the British National Party, and the English Defence League are flocking to support UKIP, the UK Independence Party. Um, they come from a place of racism and they see UKIP, which claims to not be racist, as serving their particular interests, their anti-immigrant, anti-asylum seeker agenda. Um, so I think that support is channeling to UKIP and even within UKIP we know there are many many people who have been exposed as closet racists. It's come out in the end that they have in the past said and done things or even in the near present said and done things that most people would say was racist. Um, I think what's really disturbing is that instead of challenging the UKIP agenda the conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat parties seem to be pandering to it. They seem to be buying into that agenda and seeking to out UKIP 
UKIP. Um, that's not the way to defeat UKIP's false narrative. It's not the way to get to the truth and to find a solution. Um, getting rid of immigrants or restricting their numbers is not going to solve the fundamental problem, which is that our economy has been screwed by the bankers and other big corporate interests, and they're still doing it. They are raking in billions for themselves while everybody else is suffering. Yet UKIP and the mainstream parties are pointing the finger at uh, immigrants and refugees. They did not cause the crisis. They are not to blame. And of course, this is not just a UK problem. I mean, you're seeing the rise of far-right anti-immigrant parties in Europe. And also, you know, this uh, program will be viewed in Iran. There is a huge amount of xenophobia and racism against Afghan refugees and immigrants in Iran, uh, perpetrated by the government in particular. And so this is something that we're seeing in many places. What are some of the ways in which we can combat that? Um, you know, combat the sort of anti-immigrant fervor that we're, we're witnessing, whether here or anywhere else? Well, of course, one way is simply challenge the falsehoods that are put out by the far right and indeed often by the mainstream parties. Um, you know, we need to set out the facts about, you know, who is coming here and what skills they have and the contribution they make. Now, there may be some instances where the system is being abused by immigrants. That may be true, but I think it's minor and does not uh, uh, in any way um, uh, deal with the fundamental issue that most migrants are very hard working. So are most refugees. They want to get on, they want to get a job. Um, you know, in Britain we have a crazy system where someone who's seeking asylum is not allowed to work. Uh, we, we pay them a very modest and paltry and quite shamefully small amount of money to live on, and we provide them with accommodation, or we put them in detention. All of this costs money when these people are desperate to work. And if they were working pending their asylum claim, they'd be not only supporting themselves, but contributing to the Exchequer by paying tax and national insurance. So we've set up a system that you know, just reinforces all the criticisms that many people make. Um, the other issue, of course, is that we do need to recognize that uh, some of the real problems that we do face, like the lack of affordable housing, um, you know, inadequate um, uh, skill sets in, in certain occupations, these are due to the failings of successive labor and conservative governments who failed to invest in new housing, who failed to invest in the creation of new jobs. Um, you know, that failure is why we're in the mess. You know, if governments had contributed properly to the funding of new social housing and the creation of new jobs, you know, many people in dire straits would not be in dire straits. You know, they would have good quality housing. And we know that people who are happy and well off basically don't complain. You know, they, they, they don't have a problem because they are secure, because they've got a decent house, they've got a good job, their income is adequate. Um, the grievance often starts from people who have been failed by the system, failed by the mainstream parties. When they are living in substandard housing, when they haven't got a job or their job is low paid and a zero contract hours, um, you know, that's when they can easily be manipulated and exploited by the far right and indeed the mainstream parties. One final question. I mean, you mentioned, um, you know, how mainstream parties are now taking on this sort of xenophobic language. Uh, but also, you said that there are analogies with 1930s. Does that, sort, does that worry you about what could happen if, if we don't, you know, fight back against the xenophobia? I doubt very much we'd have a full-scale replay of the 1930s, but you can certainly see echoes of it in the rise of far-right parties in Britain and across Europe. Um, many of us would have thought that 
uh, that kind of far-right revival would be very, very difficult to imagine. There were always far-right fringe parties, but they were tiny. Now we're seeing far-right parties getting you know, 10, 15, 20, even 30 percent of the vote uh, in some countries. And that is very, very worrying. What has happened to the culture of compassion and human rights that we thought had been embedded in our societies? Um, the rise of uh, the far right shows that we are susceptible as countries to some very ugly scapegoating. And that is worrying. Um, we do need to act against it now to stop it getting out of hand. Uh, we need to ensure that immigrant communities and refugee communities are protected, that they are defended, that their contribution is recognised, valued and rewarded. Okay, thank you very much, Peter Tatchell. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that interview. I mean, the reality is that it is based on myths, is the nice way of saying it. It's just pure lies, you know, um, lies about the realities of immigration and what it means for societies. And it's basically racism, pure and simple. I mean, very often people will say, well, you know, it's not racist to discuss immigration. Yes, it is. It is when you want to discuss it within a framework of blaming immigrants. Uh, for all the ills in society, not there's a huge problem not, there. Not even ills, it's getting ridiculous sometimes. Uh, it's traffic. Uh, traffic on M4 <laughs> suddenly is because of too many populations, too much and where population comes from, from abroad, you know. I think that's just, it's getting ridiculous, I think you're right, yeah. And, and I mean the reality is that, uh, you know, there, there's, for example, you know, when Peter Tatchell talks about a lot of examples uh, with cuts in healthcare, for example, and how important migrants are actually for the health service. And in Iran too, I mean, a lot of the hardest work is done by Afghan immigrants in that country and the treatment that Afghans receive. You know, many of their children not having a right to go to education. You hear these heart-wrenching stories of Afghan, the parents being deported and their children being left behind in Iran, detention and beatings and downright torture very often. Yeah, and I think that's a part and parcel of any um, sort of right wing. I mean, in, in part of modern times, the capitalism constantly generates xenophobia and racism. It doesn't matter whether it is in uh, England, whether it is in Iran, whether it is in even Afghanistan, you'll see different groups, uh, um, you know, generating that sort of xenophobia within even Afghan society. And Pakistan, you name it. And in India, you have the untouchables. And I think that's, that, that's the issue, that constantly to drive people to standard, they'll you have to divide people. They have to constantly drive the wages down. And one way of keeping the wages down and people not asking questions is not only to divert their attention, but also to make people silent and not question things. Yeah. And I think that, that seems, so to, to fight for the rights of immigration and against fascism is part and parcel of any decent political party or any movement that wants to uh, improve the lot of the human beings today. Yeah, I mean, do tell us what you think about this. I think we really need to push back the sort of right-wing, anti-immigrant, xenophobic fervor that's taking hold. You know, we have to stand up and say, hands off immigrants, you know, um, you know, and for people to come out and in full force in defense of immigrants and migrants and, and their rights. Send us your comments and we'll be happy to discuss them in future programs. Let's now go to the shocking news of the week. <laughs> In the
the shocking news, obviously everybody's heard of the heinous attack of the Taliban against a school in Peshawar, Pakistan, where 132 school children have been killed, massacred, along with nine staff, uh, the principal of the school. And I mean, really, it's so heart-wrenching when you read about and see what's happened. I mean, one, of, one, one father came and said, in a few minutes, um, you know, all of my dreams uh, ha have been destroyed, you know. And, and those dreams are destroyed on a daily basis. That's just one incident, Middle and Pakistan. The question is that why these groups are given a space to operate freely in parts of uh, Pakistan and also the uh, Pakistani government is in Kahoot. Is it arms these groups, allows these people to operate, they uh, work through various religious institutions and they carve up they've carved up parts of the society for themselves. That's the question needs to be asked. Why these uh, groups and uh, really fascist groups are given free hand to operate in Pakistan and in that region? I think that's I mean, the question. One of the things too is that some of their acts are so heinous that even sections of the Islamist movement say that they're opposed to it. For example, the Taliban in Afghanistan have said that they're opposed to this yes. attack. And you've got Al-Qaeda saying that they're opposed to beheadings in response to ISIS's beheadings. The reality is that all of them are the same. They all represent a similar bleak situation for people. Uh, and they're and just brutal. Absolutely. And the reaction depends on uh, how outraged people are, how yeah, people exactly. are to resist. And that's why the and rage has to continue. Absolutely. And also, mm -hmm. everybody needs to push all of these yeah. groups back. That's the only way they retreat and they start something questioning the, uh, themselves is for people to actually say no to the Islamic and religious fascists in the region. I think that's important. Yeah, definitely. Do tell us uh, what you think about this issue. Uh, let's now go to the uh, insane fatwa of the week. In the insane fatwa of the week, you have a Friday prayers leader in the city of Rafsanjan who has said that Baha'is, he's issued a fatwa, uh, saying that Baha'is are deemed untouchable or najis and that any form of um, dealings and dealings with them are deemed to be haram or sinful. Now again, continued pressure since the establishment of this regime against Baha'is merely because they follow a different form of Islam to the regime. Absolutely, and they, uh, this community has been ostracized from day one. Uh, when the Islamic regime was established. Many of them uh, have been executed over the years because they have uh, been told that they are uh, making religious propaganda. Um, children are actually in the school to ostracized, try to se be segregated and deny sort of normal contact, human contact with um, everybody else. And uh, they, they are denied uh, um, going and accessing any higher education. Um, the Ayatollah in the city of Rafsanjan in Iran has actually said... Friday prayers. Friday yeah. prayer. He's said the Baha'is do not have uh, citizenship rights. Mm. So, and also there's always question about the property mm. rights, all of those. They want to get rid of these people. And that's the result of having a religious government Definitely. doesn't tolerate a sect within itself. Definitely. I mean, we talked about a 12-year-old uh, Baha'i girl who was refused burial. Uh, merely because her family were Baha'i and this is an ongoing problem for uh, Baha'is in Iran and of course uh, p lots of people in Iran face problems uh, because of a theocratic regime as you said. We hope you enjoyed the issues that we raised in this week's program. We'd love to hear from you. Do keep sending us your comments. We won't be having a program next week uh, because it's the end of the year and we'll be celebrating but we hope that you have a wonderful week and a good new year, and we'll see you in the new year. Goodbye.